I'm calling the February 14th meeting of the Advisory Committee to order. I'm Donna Smallwood, the Advisory Committee Chair. Um, I'd like to start tonight's meeting by thanking the partners and the friends of all of my ADCOM members and of our guests tonight, because all of those partners and friends um, are so supportive of us working on the town's business that they're patient with the fact that we're out for another night meeting, even on Valentine's Day. So thank you very much. Um, at the start of every meeting, we put aside some time for uh, questions or comments from members of the public on items that are not on the agenda. Does anyone from the public wish to speak on something that is not on the agenda tonight? OK, then uh, we're going to begin our meeting with a hearing on uh, Warrant Article U, the Plastic Bag Reduction and Encourage Reusable Bags Bylaw. We're going to hear this article tonight, which means we're going to learn about it and ask some questions about it, but we aren't going to vote it until um, a later meeting. Our, our procedure is that we ask our liaison to give us an introduction. I see some uh, proponents who are here to uh, uh, help us understand it. We'll, um, we'll get an, an understanding in place and then we will um, first start with questions from the advisory committee and continue with any questions from the public. So with that, um, with that introduction, Tom, would you like to introduce us to uh, like to Article U? I'd like to introduce us to the plastic bag reduction and encourage reusable bags proposed bylaw. Uh, we have with us tonight uh, Andy Ayer, Steve Geronic, thank you, and Katie Puzo uh, from the Greener Cleaner Hingham. Whatever. Thank you. Um, uh, formerly the Long Range Waste and Recycle and Disposal Committee. Um, Andy, are you going to be speaking for this? Please come up to the microphone. The purpose and intent of this, and let me just read it, uh, single-use plastic checkout bags have a significant detrimental impact on the environment and to the public health, including, but not limited to, and it lists uh, a number of the uh, concerns or the side effects of what they produce. Um, the goal of the bylaw is to reduce the common use of plastic checkout bags and to promote the use of reusable bags by consumers, thereby reducing local land and marine uh, pollution, reducing waste, reducing the environmental impact of paper bags, protecting the town's unique natural beauty and irreplaceable natural resources. So Andy, um, you want to go ahead with your slide presentation? Uh, does anyone have the slide deck? OK. Um, so this is kind of more of a executive level overview. Um, so to kind of first off, uh, slide one here. Um, about five trillion plastic bags are produced annually, uh, that, and that includes large trash bags, thick shopping bags, and thin grocery bags. Um, Eighty percent of those bags are used in North America and Western Europe. Um, and Americans throw out away about 100 billion shopping bags annually. So using the 2013 EIR report produced by Parsons Brickenhoff for the city of Los Angeles and based on Hingham's population um, in tw 2012, uh, Hingham uses about 11,739,203 bags per year, and that equates to about a 511 bags per person annually. Most are discarded after one use. Average use time is 12 minutes. And only 2 to 7% of plastic bags are uh, returned for recycling. So the second slide is um, every year the Ocean Conservancy Group uh, does an annual worldwide cleanup. 
and they basically f chart out what the top 10 is. And in, and in 2017, um, for the first time in 30 years since they've been doing this, um, plastic edged out glass bottles in, the, in their annual cleanup. Um, so all 10 items in that list were all plastic based. And in 2018, that top 10 list was identical to 2017. Um, as you can see on, on the graph, that uh, plastic grocery bags are number five on the list. Um, and food wrappers, that encompasses, you know, sandwich bags, saran wrap, small product bags for food-related items. And then, you know, six is the large trash bags stuff. So on the next slide, currently in the Commonwealth, um, 92 cities and towns have plastic bag bans. And as you can see, most in blue, those are the cities with the bans. They're mostly, a lot of, the majority of them are coastal cities. Um, and in the red, the ones with the red stripes, those are currently communities that are actually supporting, have representatives supporting the current state law that's right now in the House that's under review. Um, the House bill ended with 89 sponsors, including 79 reps. And kind of of note, in the Mass House, there's only 160 seats um, in, in Congress. And our own reps, uh, Joe Machino and Patrick O'Connor, have sponsored that bill also. Um, you know, if it was to, if this was to pass in Hingham, this, you know, we would be joining those 92 cities and towns. But also, too, to be aware, in 2019, they currently are on, looking for on, on their own town meetings, are Hull, Norwell, Hanover, and Kingston. Uh, currently, Bridgewater, Duxbury, Marshfield, Pembroke, Plymouth, and Situate in Plymouth County, in uh, Cohasset and Norfolk County. Um, and the next slide is essentially is the breakdown per county in regards to cities that have and the population that that represents. So if you look at all the 92 cities and towns, it actually represents 42.74% of the population under a plastic bag ban. The, the next slide is just sort of kind of like illustrative illustrate, which is what I brought up in the Board of Selectmen on Tuesday. Um, so, Situate passed their ban in November of 2018, and their bylaw takes effect in March 2019. So, when we had that big nor'easter in January, you know, I was down there at Lucky Finn, and I kind of noticed a plastic bag in the Situate Harbor, and I do what I normally do is I take a picture of it, you know, throw it up in social media and tag it, whoever's responsible for it. Um, so in this case, it was the 99. And the reason why I bring this up is because currently, you know, sit, the bylaw hasn't, isn't enacted right now. But Situate doesn't have a 99 in, in their proper, right? 99 is in Marshfield, Hingham, and Rockland. Those are the closest 99s within their PMA. You know, Hingham is obviously the closest to, to the ocean. This is not saying that this is this came from Hingham or anything, but the point I'm trying to illustrate is that Hingham, with the shipyard and Derby, and you know downtown businesses, we're actually drawing customers from other communities that actually have these plastic bag bans, and then we're actually kind of polluting um, their towns and everything. So in a lot of ways, this is sort of kind of a, a good neighbor to kind of assist them, assist them in reaching their, their own initiatives. Um, the next slide is uh, Steve and I had gone around um, starting in December and concluding uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, downtown business survey. It was just a simple survey going in, talking to the owners, the folks up there, three simple questions. You know, are you currently using bags? You know, what kind of bags you're using? Question two, do you believe if Hingham implements a ban on single-use plastic bags, would that impact your business? You know, and question three, with the switch to paper bags, would you also promote reusable bags? Um, it was interesting to note is that for the first question, 
only 10% of businesses are currently plastic only. Um, the majority are using paper. We have slide here. You know, almost 20% that are using both. 4% um, are using another material like cloth or burlap for their bags. Um, it's about 51, 52 of the merchants. You know, one of the, it was it was interesting for us because you know one of the places we went to was South Shore Bank, and while Steve and I were walking around, I was oh we don't have to go there they don't do bags but Steve's like oh let's just go in anyway and we found out they actually do use plastic bags because they actually use them to get people for change. Um, um, the other thing is that we also met with the uh, businesses um, with the downtown association with Lynn Barkley and we had a meeting with them um, at the community center and we listened we listened to the concerns and everything you know one of the merchants she had just recently purchased uh, two years worth of bags you know so if this was to go in effect she would have a year worth of inventory left you know we checked with the, the health department who's the enforcement agent here you know and gave them the steps which is you know if they were unable to comply, then they would bring that just up in front of the, the Board of Health. And then the Board of Health would decide, based on the data of remaining inventory, whether to stay with the current date for them or adjust the date for them, basically to help them out and everything. The, the other concern that they had from the previous time that we had done this bylaw was in regards to just using solely recyclable material paper bags. Um, all cities and towns currently under bags have that as part of their bylaw. You know, one of the things that we did, because recyclable materials bags, there's a little bit of extra expense, you know, and, you know, kind of as a gimme for our, our downtown businesses and everything, the option of virgin or recycled paper bags and everything, and that kind of, you know, alleviated some of that tension. Um, Correct. Correct. Yeah. So they, they had the option of doing. Um, and then on the last slide, you know, the, the goal of this is um, is the bad by the bag bylaw will add pressure to an increasingly strong message to the legislature that Massachusetts needs to adopt a statewide approach. Now uh, as you can see, the current bill on the dock is Bill HD-143, and it calls for a ban on plastic checkout bags and adds that $0.10 cent fee for paper bags. We don't have that fee because we can't have a fee as a town. So that would have to be a state-mandated law. Um, and because that fee has actually been proven a strategy to reduce waste and litter and pollution from single-use bags. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to open up questions from my colleagues here. Erin, I'm curious if you looked into uh, PFA or the whole food delivery and any of those um, and how, because they use a plastic bag excessively. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if this contemplates that at all. Well, if it's a stop and shop. Um, I would assume, I haven't checked it out, I would assume that I can go back to Stop and Shop and ask them that question for what they're doing in Cohasset and Plymouth. Okay. Um, but they shouldn't be using plastic bags because it would be violating their bylaws. Okay. Okay. The, the, big right. so the Canes already have a path mapped out in another community. In Hingham, they can still use plastic, but, but they already have their... I already have moved forward with uh, with uh, paper and reusable. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm, I'm unclear then. So if, I'm assuming that something like PFAD is guess that there's a large distribution center somewhere that could possibly be outside of Hingham. I'm sure it's outside of Hingham. Mm -hmm. of which, and then uh, everything is bagged and then delivered. So I would just be curious to understand how if we would even have the, the right to say. From my experience, um, Peapod has, you know, used a local source um, for their shopping. 
Um, I know from Whole Foods standpoint, they use Instacart, I believe. And I know they actually have shoppers within each of their stores. And then they actually do it from there. Doors. It's where they bought it. So if they picked from Hanover and delivered to your house, they could use plastic bags because that's where they would do the checkout. Uh, yeah. Logistically, it sort of addresses it because yeah. we because then I would still be a bad actor in the sense that right. I would right. be receiving a ton of plastic bags. If right. It, that scenario. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I did have a question in the downtown building survey. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious of the six percent that said they do believe there would be an impact. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a small number, but did you get a sense from that six percent of what the impact, or what they perceive the impact to be? Uh, you know, the one merchant that really uh, she felt strongly about the plastic bags, it was just because she had bought. Oh, okay. that large, was that situation, right? The large inventory. Right. Okay. So the impact is that uh, you know losing money that she. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. Kind of follow up to the same point, Andy. Mm -hmm. um, Tom and I worked together on a recommendation, which I just handed to your committee. And if you would uh, be so kind as to look at page six, the last page, we, we added a uh, subparagraph 4D. Yeah. Which contains some specific language about giving the Board of Health the right to extend time to compliance for uh, for good cause shown for a period of time not to exceed one year mm -hmm. in accordance with regulations to be adopted by the Board of Health governing the criteria upon which an extension may be granted. Does that language work for you folks? Mm -hmm. uh, the one year period was selected because, because of the business that had the the two years supply. So if you've got a built-in six-year delay, and then if you have a hard stop on extensions, a year after that, um, that business would have over 18 months to use or otherwise dispose of their bags. Okay. So if, uh, is so, that? Sounds good. Yeah. Evan, oh, Evan and then Eric. Evan, okay. you're good. Eric? Can you speak a bit about how the uh, proposed bylaw was drafted? Uh, I know there's a million examples of other municipalities that have done this. Yeah. Uh, did you pick and choose? Did you model this on one? Uh, I'm particularly curious about the definitions and how they fit together in the use regulations in Section 3 because the, they threw me for a bit of a loop there. Yes. So the majority of these bylaws are kind of all working off of one template. We okay. took ours and we modeled it off of the Cohasset one, mainly because of the, they were our closest neighbor that, with the bag law. Um, in regards to the use of regulations, what specifically were you looking at? So if I'm reading subsection 3C correctly, mm -hmm. It's saying that the product bags, which is, you know, the vegetable bags, the, uh, you know, the, the unwrapped muffin bags, the dry cleaning bags, mm -hmm. need to be made out of uh, reusable material, paper, recycled paper, or compostable plastic. Oh. Is that, did I read it right? Yeah. And the reason why compostable plastic is because the definition for biodegradable is sort of kind of a gray definition. Compostable plastic bag is the only one that's actually regulated by the government as for the definition. Now that's we, the ASTM standard there? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we could argue the fact that in regards to compostable plastic bags, it's only truly compostable in an industrial composting facility, you know, because it sets the right um, environment for it to compost and everything. But a biodegradable bag, you could just create a bag and slap biodegradable, essentially. That's the definition. So, And so, I guess, ultimately, is Section 3C uh, either intended or expected to change what what retailers are doing right now with respect to veggie bags and muffin bags yeah the hope bags. is you know the hope for for now is to kind of 
have them start thinking about other options in the current ones that they're using right now, which is polyesterine. Sure. You're right. So, you know, we didn't want to specifically say polyesterine because that's a whole other different animal, whereas we just sort of kind of like, here are your options. Brookline is currently the only one that is kind of mandating that one. Okay. And so the expectation is that 3C won't change the way retailers do that kind of thing? Well, yeah, because the expectation is that the plastic bag would be compostable, be able to be compostable. Under this kind of gray definition of compostable? Compostable is a firm definition that's by the government, which is that highest in standard. Biodegradable is gray. Excuse me. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing is we don't dry cleaning bags are exempt, which is pretty much the standard on all these bylaws. Oh, excuse me. Yes, I see that. So I, I was a little confused. So the dry cleaning bag isn't exempt from the whole uh, ordinance. It's exempt from a product bag. Correct. Right. So a dry cleaning bag could be a single-use checkout bag, which would be banned. Correct. That's right. Okay. Okay, so the dry cleaner would have to come up with something that either is canvas or paper. Or Correct. Okay. What do the dry cleaners think of that? I haven't spoken to a dry cleaner yet about that. How's it worked in other communities? I'm not sure. I can ask. Go. I can go back and co house and ask to see what they're doing. George. One of the options is to use a paper bag, but there's an environmental cost to producing a paper bag. Correct. How does that compare to the environmental costs of using the plastic bags? Well, I mean, the difference is, is one, is that the plastic bag has the potential to actually enter the food stream, right? Whereas it, it's breaking down in the ocean, becoming a microplastic. Um, you know, fish are now thinking it's photoplankton, especially from a, you know, I know this from my own, from my father being a shellfish constable in Quincy, which was you know, shellfish actually ingest this stuff. So the potential is that you potentially be getting plastic within your shellfish and everything. Whereas a, a paper bag will break down in the environment um, and become essentially it's raw materials, just basically wool pulp, right? And, right. and there's also a cost to produce the plastic bag. Correct. To cut the trees and do whatever you do to make a paper bag. Mm -hmm. Like, there's an energy component of that. Correct, right. which is part of, when we got to this bylaw, we have, part of it is also to us encouraging reusables also. Yeah, actually, that leads uh, to my question. So that is clearly stated as one of the goals is to promote the use of reusable bags, but then there's really nothing else in the bylaw that actually does promote the use of uh, reusable bags by consumers. I mean, yep. there's nothing, it, do, it doesn't seem like there's anybody that has in the administration or enforcement a role to to mm -hmm. do that. And I just wondered what the thinking was on that. Well, I agree, that seems to me to be actually um, it may be a more important goal in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, but how does that happen? Well, you would have to create a campaign and have an opt-in campaign for the businesses. So one of the survey questions was whether or not businesses would opt in to assist us in to promote reusable bags. So who would who would have that campaign? I mean, who would be doing that work? Uh, we would be. And should that be somewhere in the bot? Should somebody have that responsibility or not? <laughs> Victor is... I mean, I think you don't want to make a bylaw that sort of, I mean, sort of sets up a committee to then go and make surveys of, I mean, that seems a little, I, I agree that the, you know, you read the purposes and it jumps out at you, well, gee, the purposes don't match everything, or there are more purposes than match the bylaw, but I don't think you set up a committee in the bylaw. Well, and I so, wasn't necessarily meaning that, but, like, it would, I would wonder if, like, the Board of Health could have something the Board of Health will encourage people. So I don't know. It just seemed like there's nothing that goes to that point, which makes it... Or you delete that purpose and just focus on the plastic bags. Uh, in the comment section, um, 
uh, let's see, third paragraph down, which is there are signs that a cultural change is underway. The last sentence uh, says the GCHC has held public meetings it, dealing with the past and met with a cross section of diverse groups, including Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and so forth like that. And then there's the future meetings, which is really about to educate people because it'll be the, a consumer choice to use a reusable pen. It already is right now. And uh, I think they, uh, there might be a mixed message or something uncertain with this where you can perhaps mandate that a business can have a pa paper bag, but I'm not sure about reusables. Right. Can you comment on that? Yes. Yeah. For you so, too, Janice, any, every, anybody on your committee? Yeah. So, you know, part of these bylaws is you're able to make them because there is, you know, a potential health issue in regards to plastic, right? And you're not going to more or less have that with paper. And reusable bags, that's a, that's a behavioral change. And you can't really mandate a behavioral change, right? For a business, for a business anyway, you know, um, really all of what you can do is create campaigns and do an opt-in and encourage people. You know, part of that having the fee for having a fee for paper bags assists in that opt-in. But as as a town, we can't do that. I would say that we talked as a committee for, on the education piece to you know if this is something that passes at the town meeting that we do have plans to talk to. Uh, businesses and organizations, social churches. We've done a lot of groundwork with starting to build those relationships within the town so that theoretically if this happens, we're able to talk to people and come up with ways of saying like, hey, maybe there's an art committee in the schools who want to design a bag and we can sell it and it can be really mutual, uh, mutually beneficial for different groups in town. And it's critically important to our team that we and keep in the, the reusable bags because that is what's going to make a really big difference. And if I can just clarify, I wasn't saying that businesses should be promoting the use of it, um, but it seemed to me the purpose of the bylaw was to get consumers to use reusable bags. So, it, and that just struck me that there's nowhere that that's discussed again. I think that's an interesting point, though, that if you're doing a bylaw and it's being driven by health effects, there's there's a limit as to what you can do. So. And then an incentive for businesses is what many do, which is they have reusables for sale for a dollar. So there's an incentive, I mean, not that they're going to make a lot of money, but it's still there's still a cost to it. And it's a, it's a, it's a choice. And um, it may not be, that in paper may not be the ultimate alternative with this. Maybe there's going to be something that's, Better that passes everything, you know. So I see that um, newspapers are exempt. I'm just wondering, um, have any other communities had discussions with uh, the newspaper delivery companies about? I mean, uh, as a as a delivery customer myself, the newspaper comes within a plastic bag every day, rain or shine. And I just wondered if there's ever been any conversations either here with your committee or in other towns about ways to change that. No, but I can ask. Uh, the Mass Green Network, what has, what they've been doing okay. um, in regards to newspapers, because newspapers are considered a product bag, which is generally exempt. Other questions? Any colleagues? You go. Andy. Uh, section 4C, the penalties. Um, it's on the email to Bob and Tom. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but. I, I I found uh, section C and D a little confusing. <clears throat> it seems to me that the the violation is selling a store selling a uh, a product and putting a putting in a plastic bag. So each sale is a violation. Mm -hmm. So I thought then the, where it ends the, on the last page, each day a violation continues, constitutes a separate violation. I, I thought that should be stricken. This isn't the kind of continuing violation. I mean, e if each sale is a violation, then it's it couldn't be continuing from day to day. Okay. 
I'm not sure I follow. I'm sorry. Well, a, a continuing violation is an activity that is ongoing, right? You started today. You, you, uh, you're you ordered by uh, the planning board to, to clean up something. You don't clean it up. Each day you don't clean it up. That's a continuing violation. <clears throat> Each time you dispense a plastic bag, that's a separate and discreet violation. And that that sale, if you will, that transaction constitutes a violation. If you make a sale that's plastic bag the next day, that's a separate, not a continuing violation. Is that reasonably clear? <laughs> it, it, it's the non-lawyer. It's the non-lawyer. But we're all understanding the same that the, the unit of violation is per day, not per bag. So if you Correct. distribute a hundred plastic bags in one day, you aren't uh, liable for a thirty thousand dollar penalty. Correct. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not what you said. That's not well, that's yes. something that I want to be clear on. Yeah. So, and is that the intention? The intent. What's the intent? Do you want the violation to be every time you sell a bag, it's a hundred dollar fine, or do you want it to be every day you're selling, you're using bags? I want it to be every day. Every day. So, yeah. lawyers, what language do we need? Um, boy, that's that's. I've never encountered that situation. Yeah. Well, well, you sell one bag and you get fined $100? Care of everything. You, you, you sell 1000 with bags and you still only pay $100? Sure. Yeah. These are small businesses. These are small business owners. Let's not put them out of business. We just, we don't don't business. Business. <laughs> we just want one. them to dis dispense plastic bags. Uh, I thought it was or, or serving alcohol without a permit. Something like that wouldn't be similar. Isn't that a violation each time you serve it? I don't well, like serving as someone who's underage? I fine for every drink they served in the bar that day that they didn't have a license. I think they would fine them when they shut them down. I actually encounter this frequently in the work that I do, which is criminal prosecutions. Each mm -hmm. criminal law has a unit of prosecution associated with it. Uh, perhaps what you could do to um, express your intent here is in place of the line that says each day a violation continues, to say something along the lines of um, uh, a violator shall not be penalized for more than one violation per day or something like that. Okay. So it's that again, a violator. A violator shall not be penalized for more than one violation per day. Unless it's <laughs> <laughs> Andy, this is free. This is free. Okay. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Expect the bill. Yeah. Uh, Andy, I do have a question. Just, just send it to Michelle. <laughs> once you're all set with that, I do have a um, question about one of the other definitions. So there. Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Just one more time. Yeah. Oh, did you get it down? Where did I say I'm going. I'm going to for more than one violation per day. Okay, thank you. So where store is defined as a commercial enterprise selling goods, food, services, etc., mm -hmm. it seems that that definition excludes any operation that's distributing goods, food, services in some fashion other than sales. I'm picturing like a charity operation where no money changes hands or Girl Scouts distributing bags of Girl Scout cookies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to make sure that that sort of thing is carved out from the, uh, from the reach of the bylaw. Is that right? Yeah, so, so the, we're trying to use this example. So the farmer's market would be included in this. Would it's be commercial, sure. Correct, right. But the food pantry, this is where we're trying to find the answer to, so, say, someone like the food pantry, right? You know, what would happen if bags, because they, they would kind of be under this definition. Um, yeah, they would they'd be excluded. They would be excluded, yeah. Okay. I think that's my you deleted the sentence, each day a violation continues constitutes a separate violation, and inserted it instead. Uh, yes. Eric's sentence, correct? Correct. It's a substitution, not yes. an additional yes. 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 Okay. Additional questions for uh, our colleagues? 
I guess I'd like to step back a couple of things before you know, we can go into the detail and sort of assuming that, yes, let's go ahead. Um, why isn't it better to just have one statewide law rather than 92 or 300 different towns with different laws that, you know, go off to Norwell and you get a bag or not. I don't know what their rules are, but you may be able to get right. a different bag there. You know, why don't we just get the legislature to do, if, if that's what we want to do, why don't we have one uh, statewide? Uh, because it's, you know, we'll use California as an example. Uh, California didn't actually institute their state law until there was a tipping point, a critical mass of the population that was under state um, bans, city bans, and everything. And that's where we kind of are right now in Massachusetts. Um, whereas we're getting to that threshold point where cities and towns, you know, more of the population is under these cities and towns. And that's when the state usually comes in and says, okay, you're right. Everyone has a little bit of variable for their bylaw, you know, and then just makes a standard across the so board. It's initiated from the bottom up. The, the community's correct. Going we are supported as a committee last year in another iteration of the, of the bill that's in the, before them now to support that, but it didn't pass. It, didn't get, it went farther. It went to ways and means, but it didn't get farther than that. And so this is the same as an effort to. <coughs> Fix them over a problem here. We're also sending a signal to the state house that this is something we need. What's the um, plastic bag industry say about the statistics that you've you know, given to us tonight? Do they sort of agree with that, or do they have a different take on this? I I don't know the answer to that. I can look and find the answer to that. But there is increasingly becoming more and more pressure on single-use plastics as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you as you know, recently, uh, uh, the European Union uh, outlawing single-use plastics now. Um, you know, so more and more countries are actually looking at it. Um, on specific language, uh, you turn to 3A. Um, I guess I wonder, in the second sentence, where you in two places say should be, should be, I mean, that seems inappropriate for a, a bylaw, which either should be, in my view, should be directive or not, you know, existing stock should be phased out, well, what if it's not? <laughs> and any remaining stock should be disposed of properly, well, what if they don't? Is that a violation? Um, so sh shall I, I would rather use shall, shall drop be. it. Yeah. yeah. Unless, unless otherwise extended. Unless otherwise extended. Yeah. Additional questions from my colleagues. Okay. Thank you very much for all the work you've done. I I know that that this is an effort that has been going on for several years. And it's evident tonight how far you have come from when um, this first came to the advisory committee. So I congratulate you for the progress you've made, and uh, we'll vote on this in late February. Perfect. Thank you. All right, thank you. I want to get my other shout in my notes here. Okay. Yeah, good. Uh, Dave Aline is going to work with Tom on, on the comment before we have it come back to us for uh, consideration. So as our guests leave, we are going to um, close that hearing and uh, move on to the additional warrant articles that we are going to consider tonight. And with the, um, the ones coming up next, we're going to um, hear and I anticipate vote on uh, the next ones that we consider. So next up, we have Article T from Eric, South Shore Park, Chapter 43D, Priority Development Site. Take it away, Eric. Thank you. And I think uh, everybody knows our guest, Emily Wentworth, from, Hello, the, Emily. Uh, from the Zoning Department. Emily, do you want me to uh, leave the charge on this, or would you like to? Either way. We're comfortable. Um, I, I actually just, um, it may be helpful, I have a prop to share, um, which is just a little map. Um, 
the area so it might be helpful to have a visual as we talk through this warrant article which is fairly straightforward it's really just a, a modest update of two prior town meeting um, actions the first in 2012 town meeting accepted the provisions of uh, mass general laws chapter 43d which is the expedited permitting law um, and authorized the town to file an application with the Massachusetts Interagency Permitting Board in order to create a priority development site within the South Shore Park. Um, the priority development site, or PDS, was then modestly expanded by town meeting in 2014 in an effort, we believe, to include the entire park. Um, so to back up just a tiny bit, 43D communities uh, commit to efficiently permit development within a priority development site, which simply means within six months. Um, and in exchange, they receive priority consideration for certain state grants and other financing opportunities. Um, one of those happened to be uh, the town's recent designation as a green community and an associated, I think, I believe $142,000 grant. Um, through that program, and, and we qualified for that in part through designation of um, a 43D priority development site. Um, it was in preparing that application that we noted a few errors um, in, in each of those two articles. The first in 2012, there were um, four parcels that were mislabeled, and you can see those on uh, what was distributed. Uh, it, they're highlighted in yellow in the beige area. So, so beige represents the 2012 parcels that were added to the PDS, um, and those that are highlighted in yellow would be corrected. Um, their their labeling and um, identification would be corrected through the present article. Um, the more significant um, error of omission was. Uh, a conflict that we had in our GIS information and our, our appraisal system, um, specifically related to what in 2014 was identified as uh, map 207 lot 21 or zero commerce road. Um, you can see that on this with uh, green base and then blue hashing over it. Um, that parcel had, in fact, merged into a larger parcel of commonly owned land um, that it, it should have correctly been identified as map 21330. Um, so this article would simply clean up those kind of technical errors um, so that we finally fulfill the intent of town meeting in including all of the South Shore Park in our priority development site. Okay. Um, questions from my colleagues? Have, we, have there been uh, proposals um, down there to, to use the, uh, the expedited permitting? So in terms of applying for state grants um, to... No, I meant developers, this, developers oh, coming in and... Uh, um, there haven't been any significant... There's certainly been um, improvements made in the park. Uh, oftentimes it's a new use coming into an existing facility, um, and those are projects that we permit kind of routinely. Um, but there hasn't been significant new building that I'm aware of in the park since since the original adoption. What, what happens if uh, the town doesn't make the 180-day uh, deadline? So uh, there, there is a release valve where the developer and the town can agree to extend the time frame. So if it's a matter of the, the applicant not providing sufficient information for the board to act or some other legitimate reason, um, it can be extended. I'm not aware of... I, it's not that it would be constructively approved then. It's no, no, it's simply a commitment. It, it's not changing our zoning per se. It's simply a commitment that the town has made. Um, and in making that, there's there were some structural changes to the organization where um, there is a primary point of contact designated for the town so that anybody wishing to to do a more significant project um, would be dealing with the community planning director and, and then her um, responsibilities would be to kind of shepherd the project through the process. 
Additional questions? Um, I, this probably kind of piggybacks on what oh, Victor said. Oh, maybe just sorry. To answer Vic's question, um, Emily's correct that the town has the safety valve to extend or to get relief from the 180 days under some circumstances, but without an extension the and the 180 days elapses, then the permit is deemed approved under the statute. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, Libby. Oh, no problem. Um, so, Emily, the, so the area in blue there on this map, so this is um, new, um, new, a new site that you want to deem as um, a priority development site? So, um, I think we would say it's a correction as opposed to a new site. It, the, the map and lot and the address associated with that parcel wasn't technically included in the um, warrant articles, the, the prior warrant articles. Um, however, it was shown on maps that were included right. with the application to the interagency permitting board. And, and again, I think that's simply the conflict between the GIS information and the the vision information. Um, and then, is this an area that has? Um, I know, looking back at some of the South Hingham study reports, but there isn't really infrastructure in this area. So even if you is there in the blue area, um, if you wanted to well, develop that, it, it would mean, sewer is, I think, perhaps the most. Um, there, there. While well, this is also part of the South Hingham sewer district, there is not, in fact, any sewer infrastructure in this area yet. Or water infrastructure. Well, there are water mains that support the existing development in this particular newly blue area. There's, there's no road. It hasn't been developed yet. Yeah, that's so. what I'm saying. I'm focused just kind of yeah. on the blue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Questions? Are we ready to vote? Is there a motion? Yes, there is. So, I recommend that this committee recommend that the town approve the filing of an amended application of the Massachusetts Interagency Permitting Board for the designation of the following properties as priority development sites under Chapter 43D. Zero Southeast Expressway Map 213, Lot 30, including the parcel formerly known as Zero Commerce Road, Map 207, Lot 21. 99 Industrial Park Road, Map 207, Lot 8. Five Pond Park, Map 201, Lot 4. 20 Pond Park, Map 201, Lot 10. And 75 Abingdon Street, formerly 105 Research Road, Map 206, Lot 12. Discussion. Discussion. Yeah. Okay. Eric, yes. Um, did you get any feedback or talk to any of the South Hingham residents? Did they have a take on this? Uh, uh, nobody appeared to speak on this at the uh, Board of Selectmen's hearing on this. Uh, I was certainly mindful of that, and that's part of the reason why I asked Emily and Lonnie to prepare the map that we see here, and they did prepare it by request. Uh, when I saw that and see where the parcels fall that is all on the far side of, um, of Route 3, uh, there are very, very few residential properties that would be, uh, that would be abutting, that would be directly affected by this. Additional discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? One. Um, abstaining? Anybody? Would you like to be recorded, Libby? Yes, please. Okay. And so we are 13-1. Libby, recording. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Appreciate it. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about uh, warrant article I, disbursement of electric light department receipts. Ed. This is a perennial article, comes up every year, has to do with the disbursement of the receipts from the uh, municipal lighting company, uh, which operates under an agreement with, with, the, um, with the board for the, for the lighting plan. Uh, will the town appropriate from the receipts of the Hingham Municipal Lighting Plant money for the maintenance and operation of the plant for a 12-month period commencing July 1st, 2019? Pursuant to sections 57 and 57A of Chapter 164 of the Massachusetts General Laws, and provide for the disposition of any surplus receipts or act on anything relating thereto. 
the um, uh, the Hingham Municipal Lighting Plant is um, is a self funding entity, and the funds collecting from collected from billing customers are used to pay all expenses incurred by the plant. The HMLP board has an agreement in place whereby it makes payment in lieu of taxes, or it's called a pilot <clears throat> payment. The pilot amount is calculated by multiplying the number of kilowatt hours uh, in the prior year by one f- one quarter of one penny, with a minimum payment to the town of four hundred fifty thousand dollars based on sales for the last several years. It's estimated that this payment will be approximately five hundred thousand dollars. The plants pilot to the town has the effect of reducing the town's tax rate. These are the very same numbers that have been in place, at least as far as I could tell, for the past three years. I went back to all the other Warren articles. And the only difference in this language has to do with the um, the estimate for how much money is going to be um, uh, included in the pilot. In uh, two years ago, uh, that language was um, that this payment will be at least five hundred thousand dollars, and I think there was some there, there, there was some discomfort because it's only four hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's at least so that last year the language was changed to approximately five hundred thousand dollars. So I think everybody was happy with that. If there's, if there's anybody who was on the ad when all that conversation was uh, taking place, I'd be happy to yield the floor to you. But that's what I was able to ascertain. Oh, I think you got it. Right. I think you got it. Questions? I think we're ready for a motion. Okay. It, uh, it's recommended that with the exception of the Hingham Municipal Lighting Plant's payment in lieu of taxes, expected to be approximately $500,000, based on plant sales, but no less than $450,000, which is hereby transferred to the general fund. All funds received by the Hingham Municipal Lighting Plant during the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2019, be appropriated to said municipal lighting plant, the same to be expended by the manager of municipal lighting under the control and direction of the Municipal Light Board for the expenses of the plant for said fiscal year as defined in sections 57 and 57A of Chapter 164 of the Massachusetts General Laws. And if there should be any unexpended balance thereof at the end of the fiscal year, such amount as is deemed necessary shall be transferred to the construction fund of said plant and appropriated and used for such additions thereto as may be authorized by the Municipal Light Board during the next fiscal year. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Yes, sir. It's unrelated to this motion particularly. Is this, does anybody know if this is kind of standard or mandatory language with respect to, is this, are they an enterprise fund? I forget it. HMLP? To my understanding, they are not. Not an enterprise. There's a separate statute that, does, that deals with. Uh, like town like plants. Okay. So this language with respect to the pilot, where basically everything that comes in to, to I mean, in other words, they get to keep, they leave behind 500, take everything else yes. under their own roof. Yep. That sounds different than, for example, the country club. Country club, right. Yes. So that's right. the distinction. And, right. Yeah. This is, okay. Never mind. Okay. Um, before we move on, I should have observed that, um, as I told you all by email, but haven't said at the meeting, we are deferring Article H on the um, transfer from the Meals Tax Stabilization Fund because the uh, selectmen haven't acted on it yet. So we'll we'll come back to that in late uh, in late February. Um, next up, we're going to um, consider a series of warrant articles having to do with. Harbors and dredging. Uh, Libby, do you want to in- introduce us and get us started? And uh, yeah, and I don't know if Ken, we have the harbor master here, and Bill Reardon from chair of the uh, Harbor Development Committee. I don't know if you gentlemen want to come up in case there's any questions. Um, thanks for coming. Welcome. So the next three articles, hopefully you guys all got my. Uh, my late-breaking news draft um, of, with the changes. Um, so these next three articles are all interrelated, and they're for uh, harbor dredging. 
and just kind of a quick overview. The first one is just to establish a, a new waterways fund under new statute. The second one is, uh, which is EE, um, I'm sorry, X. And then EE will be to transfer monies from existing waterways sources into this new fund. And then the final article we'll go over is Y, which is to actually um, go over the, uh, approve the dredging and then authorize the sourcing of funds. So for the first article, which is uh, X, um, this is just the statutory language of uh, this new Municipal Waterways Improvement and Maintenance Fund. Um, so just the highlights there are that um, this fund is, um, the, the sources of funds for this are 50% of boat excise taxes and um, mooring permit fees. And in Hingham, we also have a um, parking license um, revenue that we get, which were it not for the mooring permits, we wouldn't have that. So those are the three main sources um, that go into it. And you can see from the, the question here that there are um, four designated um, appropriations that can be used from this fund. Um, maintenance, dredging, cleaning, and improvement of harbors, inlands, and great ponds. Uh, second, the uh, public access there too. Three, breakwaters, retaining walls, piers, wharves, and moorings. And finally, four, law enforcement and fire prevention. So um, in order to be eligible for the grant that you'll see in the, in the dredging article, this um, fund under the new statute needs to be um, established. So that's it on this board article. Can clarify a yes. Question? So the use for law enforcement and fire prevention is that any law enforcement and fire prevention or, or only those those items in connection with harbor activity? I'm going to defer to the harbor master on that. So it's not just any law enforcement or any type of firefighting. It has to be related to the waterways, maritime. So to help also with what it has been used for in the past, not not because we didn't have this phone, but would be engines for a new boat, uh, a new boat if we if we needed one, other other kinds of things that you could. <clears throat> yeah. So traditionally, mooring revenues have been used also to um, assist my office with capital purchases. I know that's something that the Slack Board of Selectmen want to continue um, doing with monies in the waterways account is and is to you know buy capital type equipment when necessary. So that's, that would be allowed in the state statute that we point to. Yes. And that, I believe, was asked at the Selectman meeting. The Selectman really wanted to make sure harvest. that this new waterways fund allowed the Selectman in the town to continue to do what, you know, what it has historically been able to do with, you know, with these kinds of revenues. And, and the assurance was yes. But and so I think just kind of tying this into the capital budget, you'll see when we fund things for the Harbor Master, you'll see it's usually from mooring permits, but I would think next year the language would probably change that it would be the source of the funds would be from this fund, which will be the um, where all waterways funds will be consolidated. I want to make sure I'm looking at the right version of yes. this one. So it the, looks to me that if that this the correct version should not have the the second paragraph yes. in the comment that started currently. Yes. Okay. So there is only okay. one paragraph Perfect. in the comment, okay. and just that was removed because. Um, so it's fine. Yeah. Just want okay. to make sure I was looking at the correct one. Okay. Additional questions, George. So this is a new fund. The harbor has been dredged before. So why yes. are we setting up a fund now if one was not needed before? We have, along, yeah, we have funds now. Right? We have a waterways fund and a dredging fund, which were set up under old statute. This is um, a new fund with new statute that is specifically required for the grant. Correct. Ken? There's hey, also you want to add. There's also some context here in the sense that you know in in the years either when I was here on the advisory committee or. Then with um, uh, CPC and and now with uh, the Harbor Development Committee, we've always had to sort of figure out well, where is there money that can be used for dredging, and it was in about four or five different accounts. And I think both the law, a new law, as well as the town's direction is: look, let's get you know the revenues going, you know, put in the right place so we can all see them. 
readily without having to go to poor Sue. Uh, she's probably seen me, you know, three times a year for the last five or six years. Uh, so, you know, that that's a big part of this as well. And it's it's in part in response to, to your question, George, that I provide that. Yeah, but the original Waterways account was set up in, I think, 1981. The law has since changed. And, you know, to be in compliance with that law, we want to make sure that we have the proper account set up. And there's there are times when we're asked if we have this account and if we're putting these revenues into that account. And one of those examples is when we apply for dredging funds. That's on the application. So we want to be able to say, yes, we have the account. The funds are going in there. And it just, like Bill was just saying, it helps to kind of clean up where the revenues are so that they're easily accountable. I think it makes perfect sense. Just curious as to why it yeah. didn't exist before. Yeah, no, it's a great well, question. I was going to do the next article where <laughs> I was like, you know, it's a segue. It, 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 thank you. It was just trying to pull all the pieces together was a little... Who, whoever's the right one to answer this question. So breaking this down by source, this new fund is going to receive all the mooring permit fees. Mooring permit fees currently go into uh, a portion of... Right, right. Okay. All the mooring fees are reserved for, you know, particular uses. It's also going to get 50% of boat excise taxes. What currently happens for the boat excise tax revenues? 50% of the boat excise tax has always gone to the waterways, which okay. is the old fund. So the this old really waters. isn't changing any source or any use of any of this money. It's just routing it to a different place. Mm -hmm. Got it. It's putting it in one place. Yeah. Will the old funds go out of existence or be yes. zeroed out? Yeah. Okay. And you'll see... As the, as the articles continue, we, 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 we give you the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey said. <laughs> With bated breath, are there additional questions? Yeah. Okay, I think we're ready for a motion then. Okay. So it is recommended that the town vote to establish a municipal waterways improvement and maintenance fund under Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 5G, to receive revenue from boat excise taxes under Mass General Law Chapter 60B, Section 2I, and to receive revenue from mooring permit fees under Mass General Law Chapter 91, Section 10A, and to receive any additional sums from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or the federal government, and to require that 50% of said boat excise taxes collected under Mass General Law Chapter 60B, Section 2I, shall be deposited into said fund as required by law, and that all mooring permit fees collected under Mass General Law Chapter 91, Section 10A, shall be deposited into said fund as required by law, and provided further that appropriations from said municipal waterways improvement and maintenance fund shall be limited to the following as required by Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 5G. One, maintenance, dredging, cleaning, and improving improvement of harbors, inland waters, <laughs> and great ponds of the Commonwealth located in the town of Hingham. Two, the public access thereto. Three, the breakwaters, retaining walls, piers, wharves, and moorings thereof and four, law enforcement and fire prevention associated therewith. Okay. We come to vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining. Thank you. Okay. So, George, this one's for you. Article EE -E is the next one, which is the Transfer Harbor Revenues to Municipal Waterways Improvement Maintenance Fund. So, um, just to give you guys context, and this probably, um, my notes probably answer some of the questions that have already been asked, but um, mooring permit fees through fiscal 18 are currently in committed fund balance, and you, you'll note that when we, at the, when we get Sue's year-end fund balance memo. Um, currently, the 50% of the boat excise taxes through fiscal 18 is in the what's going we're calling now the old waterways fund. Um, fiscal 19, the year we're in right now, mooring permit fees, parking license fees, and 50% of the boat excise will go into this new fund. So this um, article will be transferring those funds, um, as well as the previous ones I just mentioned, into this new fund. Um, so, uh, and then we also will need to transfer the old waterways fund balance into this new one. 
Um, so, uh, and you'll see as we go further down, I think I mentioned there is a dredging fund, um, but because it's a capital fund, that money cannot be transferred into this new fund. So that will be the first source of funds used for the dredging. And you'll see that when we get to the last article. Um, so this article is to appropriate or transfer um, those categories that I just mentioned. So if you look at the second paragraph um, in the comment, this, this details them all out. So this article seeks to transfer the following amounts from available funds into the Municipal Waterways Improvement and Maintenance Fund. Mooring permit fees of $754,750 as of June 30, 18. The fiscal 19 year we're in right now, there's parking license for the purpose of accessing slips or moorings of 40,000. That is a projected amount. Fiscal 19 mooring permit fees of 300000 again projected, and fiscal 19, 50% boat excise taxes of $35,000 projected. So, and then additionally, the old waterways fund balance of 371408 and 35 cents as of June 30, 18, will be transferred into the new fund. So, with these various sources, and this is to your point, George, where the mooring fees that are in fund balance, we have the boat excise in the old uh, waterways fund, and then the current flow that would have gone into either of those, um, those will collectively all be transferred through this warrant article to the new waterways improvement or municipal waterways improvement and maintenance fund, and that will have a projected balance um, of a million five hundred one. 158 and 35 cents as of the end of this current fiscal year, which is 19 that we're in. And then I noted below that, that, that I've already mentioned this, that the Capital Harbor Dredging Fund currently has a balance of, as of today, 399,865.26. And statutorily, this um, capital funds can't be transferred out. So again, um, this old fund and then our new waterways improvement and maintenance fund will be the two sources then for the dredging. Um, and with this 399,000, you'll see in the following article, it's anticipated that it's a million five that are coming from those two funds. So this 399 will be the first piece, and then about a million one will come out of the million five that's noted up above here. So we'll, by the end of these three articles, we'll have a nice new account, everything will be in one place, and we'll have depleted and transferred out the old um, funds and have one new one. So that's it. This looked like a very innocent article, but it was it was a little bit of a challenge. So I don't know if you guys have anything to add. I think you did a great job of explaining it. So okay. I won't add anything, but if there's questions, I can help. Okay, sounds yeah. good. So Answer the question. Do I understand that if, when we get to the next, when we get to dredging, yes. we will use the Capital Harbor Dredging Fund first and that will empty that fund for the next winter when we do it the, right the, the final article that will be for right. us doing it yes that will empty that fund yes. and then that fund will be yes gone as well mm -hmm. and everything will be in one place nice neat place Whoa. okay and i'll mention just real quick after i go over the last dredging article um just what what the harbor master and i talked about um with respect to future um reserves for dredging so I'm just curious, how did the 399865 get into the capital dredging account in the first place? Um, Sue might be able to answer that, but I think it's from the prior dredging cycles, money that was... Oh, actually, I can also tell you... In was that my the sole research, source of the last dredging exercise? Well, there were perennial, Sue, and you probably can account... I mean, having... Mm -hmm. Which way is it? <laughs> um, having researched this, there were prior perennial... In the last... Up until the last dredging cycle 10 years ago, there was a perennial warrant article that transferred money from the old waterways to the dredging. So that was getting funded through a perennial, maybe 30K a year was going into that in anticipation of future dredging projects. And then when we, that dredging happened, it would come out of that account. As of that last dredging cycle, they stopped. Um, those transfers um, stopped, but it's kind of a moot point now because this new statute 
is meant to capture and include dredging. Right. So, Sudia, then did is there anything I misspoke on that? It's also money left over from the grant. Yeah. From the grant, from the yeah. state grant. Yeah. Okay. So, when was the last time that money went into that account? Do you know off the top of your head? It was the last time money went in. So it really was the last time you were in there digging. Yeah. Uh, the money went in. Money is currently coming out of it, though. Um, we're using um, the Slockman approved us to hire an engineer to prepare the, the dredging permit, so we're paying for those out of this fund. So it actually is decreasing a little bit right now. But We can ask this question in the next one, next one. But when the state reimbursement obviously is in the rears, it comes after we've expended the money for the dredging. And, and I assume the state reimbursement will go into this newly formed fund? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Is there any question? Andy? Uh, I just uh, I'll be sure I'm reading the right uh, article. The recommended motion starts that, that the town vote to transfer 754000 Yeah, there's actually, I think this is the, the final one, is the only one that has two paragraphs for recommended motions. And it, but it has the, the dollars, specific dollars. Yes. I, I just found that introductory clause awkward, and I just wondered if the town vote to transfer 750, 750 from uh, Maury permit fees as of 6, 13, 18 maybe, or uh, yeah, to I transfer see. 754, 750, and approximately 375. <laughs> I thought yeah, confusing, I could so. move in the fourth line down there. I I, I, I indicate the, the time frame is saying respectively, but I can certainly say that the 754 is as of June 30, and then the three, the approximately 375, yeah. because those are all projected amounts, and I can say those are fiscal year 19 amounts. I can certainly yeah, I, do I, that. I, I, or, or I'd say the 754 is from mooring permit fees received as of June 30. 2018 and 375,000 from available funds expected or projected to be received uh, in uh, fiscal year 2019. Okay. Yeah, I just tried to kind of have our normal, yeah. our standard where the recommendation kind of mirrors the, the question. Um, and since they're kind of, but I can certainly make it specify that the 754 is strictly mooring permit fee. Victor is as the yeah. is that fine? And then um, I can do that. And then originally I had it w in one um, paragraph, but as you as you guys know from the last change, that once we determined we couldn't rename the old fund and we had to have a new one, that second paragraph had to be added because the source of that was a different source. It's not available funds as what's in paragraph one. It's um, from the waterways fund. So that's why there's two recommended motions. Okay, additional questions from my colleagues? Are we? So the only thing I would add is just in terms of clarity, um, the kind of expenditures that the waterways fund is being hit for currently is uh, because there is left over and there are advanced, there's advanced work that, that needed to be done. Permitting is one. We uh, had volumetric uh, studies done of how much material is, is in the harbor and that, that, the, the cost to cover that came out of this waterways fund. So we, we've been using it in, in preparation mode for what is the next article that we're going to discuss, which is finally, you know, we're going to, we're going to try to dredge next year. Okay. Yeah, and I think building, um, the first article really gets into the sort of the ins and outs of it, and this one's focused strictly on Trans corralling all the pieces and doing the transfer. So, um, and then I should also note that in the um, comment, it does say there that um, the article is recommended for affirmative action only if the previous article, X, um, is adopted, because obviously you can't transfer something into the fund if it's not in existence. We could try. <laughs> Sue could do it, I bet. Sue can do anything. I bet she can do it. Are we ready for a motion, folks? Yeah. Okay. All right, Andy, I'm going to I'm gonna wordsmith this a little bit on the fly, and I'll, I'll get the final draft. Um, but I think what the intent is is that the, tone, uh, the town vote to transfer $754,750 in mooring permit fees as of June 30, 18, and approximately $375,000 
in fiscal 19 from parking license, uh, boat excise tax, and with mooring permit fees. Did I get the order right? Um, and so I won't detail all that in the bottom. Um, four, deposit to the town's municipal waterways improvement and maintenance fund to be used in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 5G. Do we want to vote separately? Had, had, it's, all, okay. it's all one okay. motion. And then further, the town vote to transfer $371,408.35 from the waterways fund to the municipal waterways improvement and maintenance fund, which sum was generated, and I can be specific from. Uh, yeah, actually, I don't want to. I don't want to yeah. do that because that's a catch-all. That this needs to yeah. stay because it could be from any source, um, which was generated from fees paid to the town of Hingham through June 30, 18, from any parking license for the purpose of accessing slips or moorings, mooring and docking permit revenues, mooring docking permit late fees. <coughs> Voting fines and or boat excise taxes for deposit to the town's municipal waterways improvement and maintenance fund to be used in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 5. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining. Thank you. That was the tough one. It's all okay. it's all downhill from here, guys. Okay. So this article Y is for dredging of the harbor. And so we're going to be authorizing the dredging and also authorizing the sources of the funds. So you all saw the article ahead of time with um, just a description of the fact that the harbor is routinely dredged every 10 years. The cycle is typically October to January. Uh, it was last dredged in the winter of 2009-2010. So this is the next 10-year cycle, and I stated various um, um, current surveys and conditions that are, um, are indicating that this is the year that we need to do it. Um, the project cost is estimated to be $5 million. I put on the high end because there's a decent contingency in that because we just don't know, and the grants, I think we're only expecting 50% this time. Did you say, Ken, we got 75% last time? Yeah, the last um, time it was 75%, but there's a different program. For a while, there was, wasn't any dredging funding, but there's yeah. a program now, and they're willing to match. Right. Up, up to, you know, they're willing to do 50%. That's the max. Yeah, and I think the estimate of, of the final estimate won't be due until the spring. So at this point, we're putting in a high estimate, um, which is eligible for a 50% state grant. Um, so if, um, and then I'll, the capital harbor dredging funds, which we spoke about previously, the 399000 and the municipal waterways improvement and maintenance funds. So the combination of the two of those will be the source of funds for a million five that will be used to offset the project cost. Um, this article will request the remaining $3,500,000 um, to come from borrowing, um, and that will further be offset by any of the grant money the town receives, which is expected to be 2.5. So the net of borrowing will, you know, at the most will be a million because of the ceiling we've put on the cost. So hopefully our contingency is too high and it will be less than that million. Yeah, just I do want to comment briefly. Um, there's no guarantee that we'll get the dredging matching funds. Um, oh, okay. yeah. we're, we're applying for that. They'll, the grant will be released in March. We'll be applying for it. It's a competitive process. Um, you know, we're hopeful and maybe optimistic and, and would like to, but there's no guarantee that we'll have that matching funds. Okay, well, given that, Ken, then I think it may be appropriate that we have this article say in the recommendation then that an amount up to $5 million which is what they do often when there's a grant offsetting it, and then that way we're covering covering the project for the fact that there could be a lag. Um, no, we have a million five. Right? Well, then. No. Yeah. 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 yeah never mind. I I, never mind. But, but, I've been in but, dredging land too long today. All right. <laughs> The thought I had, I mean, you and I didn't have a chance yes. to catch up on it because this came out late this afternoon. Yes. I, the contingent nature of the grant, I just want to make sure it comes through so that people understand, voters understand. So the, the language in the third paragraph of the comment, something to the, on the order of, in order to apply for the state grant, 
which, if approved, would, not will, but would, because okay. it's, it's, it is contingent, significantly defray, I think would give you know, a more honest picture of what, sure. what's going on with the state. Sure. And Ken knows that the number that the state has available for all towns is mm-hmm. $4 million. Wow. That's so, what we believe that they'll be offering in March, is $4 million for the whole state. So it's, wow. you know, there are other communities that are going to be after this money, and we okay. we hope to, this is the... But you have to have a waterways fund. You have to have your permits yeah. essentially in hand. You have to be ready to go in the next couple of months. So that's going to weed out a lot of people. But We've been, we've been working yeah. on this for two and a half years to get ready so that we're timed right when the grants going to come and we're and we should be in a, in a good position but I, okay I mean, on that point Ken, can you speak a bit about this grant program and how routinely it's offered and how stiff the competition is expected to be and why so it's applications we're in like the second year i think of this opportunity this grant opportunity that was created so they've estimated there's roughly 50 million dollars that they're looking to release for for dredging and they've Last year, they released $4 million. Um, the maximum you could apply for was $2.5 million. So we're anticipating and when they release the grant opportunity in March, it'll be a very similar $4 million total. The max that any community could get would be 2 and a half. So we anticipate the same um, grant. It's, it's competitive. You have to have your permits essentially in hand. You have to be really geared up, ready to go, and spend it in that, that, that time frame that they allow. Um, there's a bunch of other things you have to demonstrate, you know, needs, public safety. There's a whole bunch of things that we have to demonstrate. I think we can demonstrate everything um, that's required in it. So I think we're a good candidate. And um, it's really just comes down to if we're able to get our permits in, in place and really put the whole package together. I think we're a good candidate. But um, there's, again, there's no guarantee. A couple of benefits. We're close to Boston. The state's looking to redo our boat ramp um, potentially the year or two after we get dredging done. So there's a lot of things that are really important. Um, for the state to help us fund this dredging. Um, so we are a good candidate. Yeah. Can, do we, can you answer the question in the first round, um, how many communities I were think selected and what was the average grant? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how many communities there were. I think there were, I think there might have been two. I think Plymouth um, received some funds, maybe Marshfield. I think those are the two um, communities that I'm aware of, but, I, but that, I could be wrong. Statewide, there could be some other ones, but I think Plymouth might have been a big price tag and Marshfield was smaller. That might have been the, but I, but I, I, that's what I believe I could be inaccurate, so I don't want it to. I wonder how many applied. It just does Yeah, I don't know how many applied. I'm not oh. sure on that. And if Hingham were to apply for this, uh, the state grant reimbursement this year and get some amount less than the 50% that we're seeking, would we have the opportunity to reapply when more funds are released? Or is it a this is our year kind of thing? Um, I wouldn't say it's this is our year kind of thing. It's, you know, there's been a lot of time. I don't think it would just be our only year. I think we could potentially ask for funds in the following year. Um, again, it's new, and there's lots of different challenges that we're starting to notice, such as graduate prices are now going up because there's money available. Um, so there's... <laughs> <laughs> So then communities are getting their the communities same, get the vendors no the communities get the funding but then they didn't weren't able to get dredging done so how are they handling that so there's a lot of different variables we're not really sure how they're going to play out because it's so new um, but at the same time because it's new not everyone is really geared up with their permits and ready to go so I think we're in an advantageous spot but I don't think there's any slam dunk that we're going to have the funding but just observation on the comment I think you need to add the two thirds vote requirement. Did that answer the question? It did. And you have experience, uh, pretty pretty strong experience, successfully seeking grants for the town, right? Yes. Yep. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, you're like the grant king. In Doesn't town. mean I'm going to get every grant. No, though, but, <laughs> but nobody per, nobody pursues grants more than you do. So, I mean, Thank you. I think that you should be commended for that. Thank you. What would happen if we didn't dredge? That's a great question, and that's come up a couple times. Um, if we don't dredge, then the volume will obviously increase over the fall. If we put it off one year, it's going to increase over the next year. It tends to start growing exponentially now, so it it's, grows at a much faster rate. The last time we dredged, um, we were we dredged 89,000 cubic yards, and we were lucky to get it done in one dredge season. So if we were to put this off too far... That what could happen is we could not might not be able to get it dredged in one season, and we have to dredge in two seasons, or we have to bring um, uh, we, when we bid it out, we have to have the contractor bring another scow, another tugboat in, 
and they have to dredge more material within it to the same time period, so there's more trips out to sea, so it gets more expensive that way. Um, so, and we're also seeing that they're not giving an extension into February, which we had last time. Now, the last time we dredged 89,000 cubic yards in one season, that was, that was an awful lot to dredge in that one time period. The only reason we got it done is because we had the extension into February. The contractor actually showed up several weeks late, and because he was late, he had to foot the bill for an additional scow, and they worked double time to get it done. Otherwise, they may have been in breach of the contract. So right now, the volume we have, which we anticipate to be about 70,000, is, is what you can reasonably expect to get done in one dredging season. So if we put it off another year or two, we're getting, to the, we're getting really close to not being able to get it done in one season. You have to either do two seasons or bring in additional equipment, which causes the price to go up. It's two I, seasons I appreciate that detail. Costs. I'm looking at this from a much more simplistic mm -hmm. impact st standpoint. Um, does it mean that, you know, that moorings will have to be moved, recreational boaters can't go, you can't get well, through certain, yes. I mean, like, very... So that's a, that's a, okay, that's a good way to look at it. I didn't say that. But, yeah, that's that's very true. So what we're seeing now is at Town Pair, um, at low tide, two of our boats are stuck in the mud already. Um, boats are having trouble getting in and out of the fairway, not the federal channel, but just the, the, the opening between the boats and the inner harbor. At, at low tides or close to low tides, sailboats are getting stuck. Moorings are starting to become unusable. And that will grow much quicker over the next year or so because the areas where it's already very shallow are getting much more shallow, and that's the edges of the mooring field. So we are experiencing those, those things. Um, if you look at the boat ramp, that's actually become like intertidal now. So at low tide, it's well above sea level. Um, people are trying, actually think they can drive their, their trucks now and stuff out into the, to the sands. We're getting vehicles stuck, so it's definitely causing some problems. And um, we don't want to let it go too far because then, then people start to complain. You know, I got my boat, I can't use my mooring, I, can't, I got stuck in with my family in the boat in the, in the fairway. So it does become problematic in that respect. And that was an issue the last time we dredged. But many, many moorings were becoming unusable and it was becoming a, a safety hazard. And these are all things that we then all articulate in our grant application that they're looking for. You know, what's the impact on the economy here? Um, the usages of the boats for the harbor master safety, getting in and out. So, Kenneth, you were unsuccessful in, in the grant round that's coming up. What would you do? Would you wait another year for another grant round, or would you? So that's not them? my decision. Um, that's really, I think, a decision of the board of selectmen. Um, I think Bill can speak to this. I think that the selectmen's office and the town administrator's view is they don't really want to wait um, another year if we don't get the grant. I think they want to get this done. But, uh, but I'll let you let you chime in. At the selectmen's meeting, and I'm trying to remember, someone was there. I turned from, from the advisory committee. Uh, the question came up. We talked about the the opportunity cost if you end up in a second dredging season. There's a there's a big mobilization component to lining up the dredge and the scow. Uh, if you do that in a second year, you've added I think it was five or six hundred thousand dollars right off the top. Uh, so th there's a there's a real uh, bonus to making sure you get it done in a single season. And to the extent that you wait another year and you put the single season dredging um, program at risk, then you, you you could encounter some fairly significant you know cost differences, let alone the, the extension of the inconveniences that always happen at the end of the cycle. As we get toward the end, you know, the, the kinds of things that he's describing, I've seen, this will be the th third time, fourth time I've seen the harbor dredged in my time in Hingham, but by year 10, it's, it's pretty obvious. Don, I, the one other thing I just wanted to go back to Eric's point um, so that everybody, again, appreciates. The grant program has changed hands within the government. It, this used to be under uh, Department of Environmental Protection. It used to be under the Fisheries. Waterways Division of um, the state. And it's shifted to the Office of Economic Affairs. Housing and Economic Development now. It's under. Which is, is interesting. And in, in, in part, it's, it's a state you know, philosophical shift where they're saying, you know, we want dredging in part to have economic impact on, on town. So they're, they're focused very much on harbors like Gloucester or Plymouth or uh, harbors with a, a large, you know, fishing, fishing fleet that adds economic value. You know, for us, that's a little harder argument. Our economic value added is uh, boaters coming, using, using the harbor, uh, out-of-town voters coming to use the boat ramp, people coming into town, tying up, using restaurants and all, and all of that. 
Yes, but that takes right, away some right. But in terms of you know to the to the state, what does dredging do for the town and or the region? It it adds you know econ- economic value. But you know to that, that's why when Ken says it's a new program, you know the old program was under that you know a, a different rubric, was much more kind of environmental minded and Army Corps, you know a lot of kind of stuff. Now there's a there's a real economic bite in that. You know, changes the dynamic of how this grant program works. Again, hence my wanting to be clear on the contingent nature of the grant. But I think the economic um, impact is is a little bit more significant. That I mean, Hingham's had a harbor. It's the, it's one of the focal points of our community. It adds to property values. I mean, there's a lot that that we can articulate in our grant opportunity about um, economic benefits to dredging to dredging Hingham. So I, I think it does have um, a, a very a significant impact on our economy here in the town. But but just wanted to touch back quickly on what I would do, and I, I don't think I can fairly answer that right now, and it's really not my decision. Um, I think that has that's a decision that would need to be made as we get much closer to the project. A, do we have all our permits in hand? We don't have control over how fast is the federal government or the state will issue our permits. If we don't have our permits, obviously, then maybe we need to defer a year. Um, so I think that's really a decision we have to wait till we get much closer to the project. But the important thing right now is really to gear ourselves up and show the state that you know we're ready. If we have our permits and we have our funding and we can demonstrate on the application that you know we're we're a good community to fund, then then we stand a good chance I think of of getting the funding. So that's what we're really trying to do: just gear up, get ourselves ready, so that hopefully we can receive the funding. But to make that decision, I think it's really would be hard to make now. We just really have to wait and see. Um, what things might be holding us back and then and look at the, the forecast of what other communities might be looking for funding in the next year. I mean, so I think there's all those things, but we really don't want to be putting this off because it will get more expensive. That also impacts the, uh, the bids because we can't really put this out to bid until you're closer to the actual doing of it. And, you know, as Ken has in, indicated, uh, the bidding has been kind of – Valuable for a long time was is heading down. Now that there is, you know, some other communities are trying to do this as well. There's more demand. At our meeting last night, Harbor Development, uh, Alan Peralt, former chair of the Harbor Development Committee, mentioned that. Well, by the way, Cashman uh, is doing this major three-year dredging process. Uh, project in Boston. They've drawn, you know, equipment from New York and from other uh, states. So there's a lot of equipment around that may help us, may hurt us. We don't, we don't know. So we're, 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 by the time we even get to town meeting, we'll know a lot more about what the bidding uh, environment may be. So a million and a half against a five million dollar estimate today. What was the ratio of? Uh, kind of boring fees, uh, waterway funds versus the total cost of the lesson. More than half. More than half. Well, wait a minute, no, because we were getting a, a higher proportion of, of grant, but I I don't have those readily. Well, at- we were we had fifty seventy five percent funded from the state. I don't know exactly the breakdown. You're talking about the town's proportion, like what the breakdown is. Yeah. Well, I'm just, I mean, at the risk of being super direct about it, like if you're a boater, you're paying into this fund, you're benefiting. I, we all benefit. Don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting not everybody benefits, but I'm just trying to weigh, you know, 30 percent here. Now, leaving aside the grant, you know, 30 percent coming out of the mooring fees against uh, uh, this project, and then if the last time was 50 percent, I'm just throwing that out there for discussion. And imagine as you guys look at HDC and otherwise, whereas what is a mooring fee set at? I'm sure there's plenty of debate about what the right charge would be and. So I, I, I'm taking a little bit of a step back and kind of a bigger question. I'm thinking about like, you know, what's the what's the appropriate proportion of the mooring fees, boater rip fees versus town participation? And so so when it comes to setting mooring fees, there's guidelines that we have in the statute, um, chapter 91, section 10, uh, 10 a, I believe it is, that articulates um, what a town can do to set their mooring fees, and we can't just set it at any type of random number we want. We can't just say, well, we want to generate a lot of money for dredging. We're just going to raise the mooring fee. Um, th- what the statute suggests or tells us is it really needs to be commensurate with what the town spends on their harbor master's office, the, the cost of overseeing the mooring permit process. Um, now, it can actually, in any given year, it can be a little bit more than what my office might might spend for managing moorings and so forth, because in some years we have capital expenses, we buy a boat, we buy an engine. So uh, mooring fee, uh, the amount that we're, what we're allowed to set them at is, is pretty well regulated, so we, it's hard to just 
say, you know, we can't be saying, well, we're going to raise mooring fees just to to cover dredging. We can do that as long as it's within the, the metrics provided in the statute. And for your knowledge, we, we increased mooring fees two years ago. So so there was a They've been going up 50 cents for the last couple of years. So I have a hunch that the growth in dredging expense is outpacing the growth in mooring fees. So, that's so it's reasonable fair. to think that there's going to be a growing percentage of the town's participation as you know, 10 years from now, 10 years from now. I mean, it may, may, may just be the nature of the beast of being a coastal community. And, <coughs> and I don't think a piece of that is the, um, just the state and federal funding cycles and what's available for grants. Because like you said, previously there were more opportunities. This is what's out there now. I mean, there's those go through cycles, I would think. Yeah, and we don't know what the dredging is going to cost. Last time around, we anticipated it was going to cost three and a half million. We came in just under two. Um, we have a we have a desirable harbor to dredge because a contractor can come here and sit here for the whole season and they're not moving around. So that's that's desirable. Um, but at the same time, um, there was a community on the South Shore, I think, that they bid out a project. They thought it was going to cost a million and it came in at two, so they didn't do it. So it's we really don't know how this could come in. It could come in well into the five and we, we could be right on target or we maybe we can't even do it this year because we don't have enough funding. So it's really hard to... Uh, I, I had uh, two questions, and, and one maybe moved. Maybe I, I missed what you said about the contingency uh, language that has to be added to the comment. But in the second paragraph, where it says the project is estimated to cost five million on the high end, and is eligible for a fifty percent state grant. You, you're going to put in some contingency language, and I assume it's not really realistic to say that the town is eligible for. 2.5 is eligible for 2.5 million of a four million dollar pot, right? Yeah, Andy, I, I wasn't planning on adding anything about the contingency because every project that comes in a Warren article has a contingency, and because you just don't know until we get the final quote. So there is a um, contingency in the five million, um, but I think because that is an estimate. I don't. We don't want to say two point five because it's fifty percent. No, 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 no. I don't mean an estimate on the uh, the five million. I mean to say that on the grant is eligible for a fifty percent state grant. Yeah. I, I think is misleading, if because what you're saying is we're eligible to get two point five million of a four million dollar pot, and I suppose we're technically eligible, but extremely we're unlikely. We're eligible to apply. I can say to apply. I mean, I, what do you think the chances are we're going to get two point five million? I would say zero. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say zero. Um, I mean, I can't really guess what our percentage is, but I don't think it's zero. I think it would be, I would hope it would be much higher. But I mean, I don't. I really don't think it's zero. I think we do have a chance, uh, but I just don't know what the. It really comes down to when those applications come out. You know, how many towns have got their permits in order, and and, and you know that's a, that's a challenge right there, especially when in a. Grant their opportunity that's only been out for two years. Andy raises a very good point, though. Yeah. The, uh, the amount of the ask compared to the amount of the available funds, I mean, it seems to me that that ought to be mentioned in the comments. No, I agree with that. I'm just saying I don't think it's zero. I think we do have a chance. Sure, sure. We have a chance, sure. but I, I, I agree. That ought to be mentioned in the comment, too. <laughs> no doubt. And, and, and we have a chance for the amount of money that we may or may not be that large as well. I mean, they, the state could make the decision to shave everybody. So Andy, they, they lean offer to where it would say and is eligible to apply for a 50%. Do you want to say for up to 50 eligible to apply for up to a 50% grant? I think maybe the point is more that there's only a pool of 4 million. No, well, I, we don't I, know that I, I the pool that. exactly yet. Yeah. We don't know until March, but that's what it was last summer. But only did. two communities split four million last year, so um, oh, I believe. I, I, you know, I think you're hearing the point, yeah. and and you'll be able to tweak the comment to 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 just be realistic about what's and out yes. there. Yes. Eligible applies is certainly better than eligible. Yes. But for the grant, yeah. the the other question I have is I'm looking at the comment and the article that. In the uh, 2009 warrant, and did you say that two million was spent to dredge in 09, 29? Oh, we, I believe it was just under two million, maybe okay. 1.8, somewhere 1.9. Okay. 
What, what the comment says is that the town's cost is expected to be approximately 25 percent of the total, with the state and the federal government paying 75 percent. And uh, the next dredging is expected to be in 2021. So this is what you're doing now. And it says a reasonable estimate of the town's share of the cost of that future 2021 dredging based on historical tr trends is 1,600,000, which says that the total amount of the dredging in 2021 is going to be 6,400,000, and we expect 75% of that to come from state and federal grants. Under the old program. Under the, e e yeah. Both of those are moving parts of the estimate and how much you're going to get for a grant. So, I mean, I read that comment, too, and I think we just have to go based on what today is out there for grants and what the estimates are we have because that's 10 year old you know no, no i understand but but they also had a contingency here they said therefore approximately one hundred thirty thousand dollars a year for each of the next 12 years will be required to fund fund the town care dredging in approximately 2021 in other words yeah I'm gonna if we appropriate if we appropriate 130 to the dredging fund each year for the next 12 years we'll we'll be all set and uh the in fact the article said uh that uh, the comment goes on to say that the revenue generated from the uh, uh, deposit in the waterways funds is such that the a hundred thousand a year can be paid into the dredging fund so the recommended article was that the town transfer thirty thousand from the waterways fund to the mm -hmm. dredging fund and it doesn't yeah. say how much was in the dredging fund at that time and then appropriate the sum of a hundred thousand to be transferred to the dredging fund. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, yeah, I can address that, Andy, because yeah. I looked into all that, and at that beginning period that you're talking about, the dredging fund was, um, and I don't want to get caught up in the um, the mud, um, but it was uh, um, at that time the dredging fund was at. Well, this is actually at the end of that cycle. It was four sixty six. Um, it's now three ninety nine. At the end of the last, after the last dredging. So I actually don't have what it was the year okay. before that. But what I will say is, I think I mentioned it, I want to say two things about, I mentioned at the beginning of this that at one point, going back 10 years and prior, there seemed to be a perennial warrant article where they were transferring from the um, either mooring permits or the waterways fund, waterways fund to the dredging fund, into that capital fund. Um, and while that perennial warrant article seemed to kind of fall off, I will say that the fact that we're utilizing a million five of mooring permits um, and boat excise tax, it's a combination, for this dredging cycle tells you that effectively 150000 per year for the last 10 years of that total pot of, you know, money has in a sense been set aside. Um, the, the, the nature of the old waterways fund and that capital dredging fund um, is is now going to be different with this new statute. So maybe this is, I know we want to go back and do that, um, the recommendation, but just so that you can see how this all fits together, is that Ken and I talked today about um, the fact this new fund is intended to capture everything, including dredging, which I don't think, you know, that what that was the case before it was supposed to be that separate fund. Um, and then the actual cost of this project, we're going to know later this spring. So that $5 million won't be an unknown in the spring. Um, by the end of 2019, we'll know, I think, by then what the grant is, right? I don't know when they... Oh, yeah, we'll know, we'll know next spring. Yeah. Um, so I think originally in your comments, Bill, you thought it was the end of 2019. So maybe it's, you know, maybe it's, you know... Let me, let me just try to reset this to make sure I... I follow you. So it was anticipated that the town would appropriate each year a hundred thousand uh, from the from the waterway funds mm -hmm. into the dredging fund, but but that didn't happen. Um, but, but by the accumulation of funds in the waterway fund, so that it's a happy coincidence that we come up with the same roughly the same amount of money, a million five. Yeah. 
Right. Well, I will say that actual mechanism of the transfer from water race to the dredging fund, for whatever reason, that mechanism stopped happening. Right. But I think it's everyone's understanding and intent that the bulk of the money that's coming from the waterways in the town, because dredging is such a big item, is I think a lot of the money we tend to be, and you guys can, can tell me what you think, and I know even from capital, is that there's always very much of a – hands off those funds because they're really the biggest reason they're there is for dredging um and so if you look at what's being contributed this cycle it's effectively 150,000 from the last prior has been accumulated from the last um over the last 10 years and you know the next dredging cycle will be 20 in 2029 2030 and so Ken and I have talked about that once these numbers get settled and we know what the actual cost is. We know what the grant is. Let's see what our net cost is. And then for these fiscal years of, and I'm, I might add this little blurb to the comment, is then for fiscal 21 through 30 is because it's in one fund, there won't need to be a warrant article, but that's something that Ken's going to keep track of and say, you know, and, and Bill as the, you know, as the chair of HDC is to know within that fund, almost like Sue's fund balance memo, like what's, or general fund. So, um, so that the idea what's would, committed? Yeah. So, that, so the that idea would be like reserving like hundred thousand a year. Yeah. Will uh, in will stay in the new waterways fund, but will be committed. set aside, if you will, or committed, committed for dredging. For dredging. Yeah. So so that yeah yeah I think that's a, a good idea. That still anticipates a lot of federal and state money, but yeah. so I don't know if you if you need to raise that, you might have to based on what the what the grants end up being. Yeah. I think we're going to wait and see how these numbers all shake out, see the net cost, and then just make sure that within that fund, how Ken keeps track of it and keeps Bill in the loop and all that, is that, you know, for those fiscal years, a tenth of it every year, put that in a committed, like Sue has, a kind of a committed category, and it's hands-off. It's for dredging and nothing else. So, And that's kind of how people look at it now, just so you know. Yeah. Could be handled. Both my questions just got answered. Well, good. <laughs> Alrighty. Good. Good job. Um, You're welcome. I, I was going to say all the questions were answered. Be careful what you say, but <laughs> yeah. apparently not. So, we you take the one and a half million and pay cash and then borrow the balance? Is that the idea? From a, okay. I understand that logic, but again, for, for benefit of kind of understanding, think think about the numbers that we've talked about. The running permits is about 300000 a year. Excise has pretty routinely been about 35000 a year. And 50%. 50% of it. And this parking uh, has is under contract currently for a kind of long term for 40000 That's $375,000 a year. To your point, Dave, I think you're right. That the mooring, I mean, excuse me, the dredging costs are going have been going up faster than mooring permits. But, but by virtue of this bringing it all together, we are going to be far better positioned to deal with. If it's a bigger proportion that we have to pay for, it'll come out of directed waterways related revenues rather than hitting up the town. Are we ready to proceed, folks? Yes. A motion, please, Libby. Okay. Um, and before I make my motion, I want to ask the attorneys in the room. I had added the um, sentence in the latest draft about, um, and I think I should delete it, the paragraph underneath. We know that, um, I'm going to read the first one, in order to apply for the um, state grant, we know that Article X has to be adopted. But then I had added, in order to consolidate the funds, um, which will be the source of these funds that then EE needs to be approved. But I think we have the one million already, so I can't imagine town meetings going to vote against EE. But I hate to link this to EE, so I don't know for the attorneys in the room if 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 they are okay with leaving that in there, or do you feel that there's some risk that EE would not get approved? And now we. So I did a. Well, it, it isn't really, but I wanted to note that the one five was coming from that new fund. So if you, if you I, I don't feel fund like the new fund, if you don't put money in the new fund, you really don't have the ability to do well, it from. But that's the yeah, and that's the EE. I mean, I just don't want to lock us in where if for some reason EE, I don't know why, if it didn't pass, then all of a sudden we're saying that, you know, well, what that. You, what you, what you, above you say capital hard dredging funds and waterways improvement. 
of 1.5 million will be used. Yeah, so I had a note. I don't think. I'm just going to delete that. I'm just going to. So my note was to delete that. I just wanted to bring it to everyone's attention before I read the motion. So, we ready? Recommended that the town appropriate an amount not in excess of $3,500,000 for the dredging of Hingham Harbor. To meet said appropriation, the treasurer, with the approval of the Board of Selectmen, is authorized to borrow said sum under Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 44, Section 7, or any other enabling authority and to issue bonds or notes of the town, therefore. Any premium received by the town upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, lest any such premium applied to the payment of the cost of issuance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 44, Section 20, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount. And I noted any state grant money received for this project will offset offset said borrowing when received. Can I just make Do we need a second on this before we continue? All the lawyers are <laughs> all right, jump now. I thought I heard you say that in the event that we do not get the grant, you wanted this to go up to five million. No, I, I had misspoken because we already, we already have a million five in hand. I, okay. I misspoke. The, the million five need not be the, the town Meaning, need not take any action for you to use the million five for dredging. No. You can just tell city Because the previous write, write article put everything in that one fund, so it's sitting there. All right. It's fund for dredging. Okay. Do we need a last sentence or recommendation? Well, I, you know. I mean, if the <coughs> when, when the state grant money comes in. Wouldn't it automatically be offset against the borrowing? I just thought for a reader, you know, for someone at town meeting sitting there, they might say, well, wait a minute, three, five, thought you were getting a grant. So I just noted if, you know, any grant money that would receive would offset the borrowing. I, I think it probably belongs in the comment, though, rather than the Okay. Motion. Can I ask a question? Just what, are there, is there any possibility of federal grant money? Um, I don't think there's any. I think the, the state money we're getting is a combination of state and federal. But I can look into that. I can look into that. I think um, I think someone just brought up a really good point about the um, municipal waterways fund. I think that does require appropriation. Um, it says it in the in Article X: appropriations from said municipal waterways approved in a maintenance fund. So you're thinking that this recommendation well, should include that? Appropriate to me. As long as it's, um, yeah, but that's that's in addition to the 1.5. So it's Article X, um, and I just looked at this really quick. So it's about halfway down. If you look on the left, it says um, law and provided further that appropriations for municipal side waterways improvement and maintenance fund. So in order to spend funds out of the waterways, I believe it does require an appropriation. So, so it's, I'm working on really quick here off that question. So, it's the, it's the <laughs> so I'm prepared for well, it. You just have to appropriate degree, not so just three and a half million, you also have to lawyers. appropriate the, the, the million and a half that will be in the waterways fund. You I think to, to be yeah. a full five. To be safe, it might be best to just appropriate the full five, the million and a half in the waterways. and. Yeah. But I, 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 I would let the committee make that decision yep. and, and all the experts there. Um, it does say appropriations. It's belt and suspenders, and if somebody says we don't need it, if council, when it goes up to them, say we don't, then it's just crossing it out. But I think at this point, since we're voting on it tonight, I think it's a good idea. So in that case, the motion on why would be a million and a half dollar, or whatever the correct yep. precise number is, appropriation out of this new Municipal. waterways fund. Yep. Or you just yeah. change it to 3.5 to 5 and say including 1.5, uh, including a 1.5 million appropriation from the new waterways fund, right? Or does the three and a half million have to be called out separately with the borrowing? Yeah, I was just going to add oh, a separate okay. paragraph. Yeah, so yeah. just that the town will Good appropriate point. a million five for the dredging of Hingham Harbor to meet said appropriation. Um, I can look at the other language on that one. It will be um, or appropriated from the Municipal Waterways Improvement and Maintenance Fund. Or, or from the Reserve General Fund should that fund not be approved. Mm -hmm. right. 
We have <laughs> everything covered. Oh, is that too com- is that too complex? I didn't mean to. So I don't mean to. I'm just trying to make sure. It's a good thing that you're an attorney, but. <laughs> Are we are we are we close enough here that we're willing to vote, or is this another one we need to defer and get our language straight? That's vote. Yeah. I agree. Okay, so we're going to under X. Yeah. Isn't the money that's in the waterways fund being transferred into the municipal, the new fund? Right. Yes. Uh, that's one piece of what's being transferred in there. It's okay. the waterways fund, it's the mooring permit fees that are in committed fund balance, and it's the current fiscal year's mooring permits and 50% of the excise tax and the parking fees. So those five are all in the transfer so, in EE. So we are proposing that we would add a first sentence that, it, that, that isn't here yet, that the town would appropriate a million five. A million five from the, from the municipal waterway. Well, can't we just say increase the amount to five million and say from the municipal waterways fund and available fund? Mm-hmm. 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 We're bonding. Oh, we're bonding. Okay. We're bonding. And the borrowing has that whole okay. separate language. Right. Okay. All right. We have amended the article to add a sentence to address the appropriation from the Municipal Waterways Fund. We have also amended the recommended motion to re- re- remove the last sentence about state grant money and move that to the comment. Is everybody clear what, what we're doing? Is there additional discussion? We're ready to vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining. Hallelujah. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you all. And thank I, you very much. I owe Sue, Ken, and Bill a big thank you. Well, we owe you all a thank you. Because so this you. was... <coughs> it's been 10 years. Not as straightforward as it seems. I know. How did I get the like war articles to come up every 10 years? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to uh, the remainder of our... Uh, Agenda liaison report from the library. There is a liaison report from the uh, library subcommittee, which you may remember consists of uh, Julie, Olivia, and myself. That uh, liaison report is that last night, uh, by a divided vote over a substantial minority, the library board of trustees uh, withdrew the one article that they had put forward regarding their construction project and uh, at the same time asked the selectmen to withdraw the two articles that they had put forward relating to the, uh, the library construction project. What was the vote? Uh, nine to four, I think. Five. Nine to five? Nine to five. And what was the, can you summarize um, the, uh, the kind of gist of it? Uh, I can't, actually. Uh, it's, I think, safe to say a... Um, complex confluence of reasons that are, are somewhat shape-shifting in nature. I think if you asked multiple members of the, uh, the Library Board of Trustees why they took that vote, you'd get multiple different answers. And uh, I don't feel like I'm in a good position to, uh, to speak to what was on their minds. That having been said, uh, you know, we all know David Mahegan, the chairman of the Library Board of Trustees, who's spoken with us before. Many of us know Lucy Hancock, uh, this committee's former chair, who is now on the Library Board of Trustees. Uh, they both were present last night, and I'm sure would be happy to speak to uh, the result of that vote. Uh, just to be clear, my recollection is that that means they're walking from the state grant. They're walking away from nine plus million dollars of state money. Right. That's right. My recollection. And I should say, I'm sorry, the town is walking away right. no, no, no. from nine plus million dollars. So of state doing, money. They, they eliminate the ability to to get that grant. And then, as I also recall, the grant cycle, if it was to appear again, is in an undetermined time, but potentially a few years down the road if it was to reappear? I think they are projecting that the next grant cycle for this program might be in 2025, I yeah. think okay. is what they said. So, yes, that's correct. Mm-hmm. Julie or Libby, did you want to add anything? Uh, 
Um, I would just like to add that it, it was very disappointing to me um, what happened with the library and the pulling of the article. Um, we followed the project. We started to work on the comment uh, or uh, make a plan, but um, I just feel like the library is um, extremely important in the education of a community, um, and there is the reality that um, libraries are changing now from being a merely a book repository to a place where the community meets and collaborates together. And the library, like the schools, have processes in place um, to do periodic master plans of their facilities. Um, and this library renovation project came out of that process and came during a time that the state was in, in a position to offer match, uh, matching or some funding for that, which in this case it was $9 million. Um, in this situation with the library, um, perhaps the project became more involved um, because in order to accept state money from the library commissioners, they had to have certain renovation criteria um, that had to be satisfied. Um, in the end, maybe the library isn't quite broken enough like other town buildings in need. Um, we know that we have all these other capital projects looming. Um, there is a fear in, among some that the library is now going to be kind of pushed to the back of uh, the line in light of the other capital projects that are ahead of this town. Um, and as a committee, I just we're going to have a discussion in the future, I believe, um, the, about this, uh, but I would just like to make uh, mention that I think that the town has a need for long-term facilities planning, both for the maintenance and repair or replacement of our um, facilities town-wide. And I think the town um, could look at all these buildings as a whole, including the library and the schools, um, and this plan could be a tool for the future uh, to help steer our processes and decisions in the future. It's well said. Very well said. Thank you. Good. And I, I want to observe that, that um, <clears throat> Julie's making the observation that we could be we well served by um, longer term facilities planning, longer term capital planning. She is the third or fourth of our members who have talked to me about this in the last several weeks. So I'd like to um, bring this up at an ADCOM meeting in the future when we are past the crush of the business at hand and, and, and have a discussion about it. And Donna, I would just like to say as the third person on the subcommittee, I totally um, echo your thoughts, Julie, and I would just say as a long-term member and chair of Capital Outlay, this is a topic that we've talked about a lot as far as long-term planning. We've There really isn't a committee for that, so we've tried to at least um, broaden our report in the warrant to put some of these things on the radar screen, and I hope that maybe in doing some of that and putting some numbers with those that has hoped to, you know, helped to bring this to people's attention, but you're absolutely right. This needs to be looked at um, from a big picture perspective and make sure that everybody's voices are heard and um, all the projects are evaluated. How much the library anticipated they would need in addition to the state rent? 17 million. 17? That's right. From the town. Yeah. Or were there funds? Well, it was be 17 less 1.1 of capital uh, private donations. Oh, the and total, then less the total cost energy. was 27 million. 27, and they go. Yeah. Well, that's relatively stunning. Okay. Um, I neglected, I made a mistake and neglected to list a liaison report from the schools, which means we can't discuss a report, but we can hear one way what George wants to have, offer us, which is an update from. Monday's school committee meeting. So this past Monday, the school committee presented their budget to the public. There was an open public meeting. Uh, the public was invited to attend and to ask questions or raise comments or whatever. Um, I did attend that meeting. Um, the, uh, the administration presented the budget as, as the opening part of that meeting and then uh, solicited questions and comments. Um, there really were no comments or questions, um, but one thing the administration was able to say is that they um, have found some additional um, savings, uh, primarily from uh, retirements that were not known a few weeks back. Um, they also had an, an additional expense in the way of a vocational tech uh, tuition that was 
contemplated but has now been confirmed. Um, so at this point, we have a total of $172,363,000 in reductions from their original budget. Um, one hundred seventy-two thousand three hundred sixty-three. That's off an original budget of fifty-four million nine hundred and forty nine hundred forty thousand four hundred fifty dollars. So the uh, the increase um, that they have uh, currently, which has not been voted by the school committee yet, uh, is five point three one percent, which is down from a five point six four percent increase initially. They did comment there may be a few additional personnel issues that would reduce, would result in further reductions. Okay. Thank you for that update, Director. Appreciate it. Um, a little bit of housekeeping after I sneeze. Oops. Um, with my apologies to um, all of us who would rather be on vacation, I am going to call a meeting for next. Wednesday the 20th note that it's a Wednesday not a Tuesday or a Thursday our normal um, routine we'll hear um, uh, the route 3a engineering article the country club equipment article and several of the zoning articles um, it is really a gift to break up the zoning articles a little bit it's sometimes a, a, a forced march to get through them all. Um, so, and, and I appreciate the folks who come out for that meeting because it will make the, the following two weeks, the last week in, in February and the first week in March, more bearable. Um, those get to be really, really busy weeks. Same time, Donna? Uh, same time, 7.30, please. Uh, if we have already voted your article, other than tonight, your deadline is Sunday to get it in. Our editors really need help getting a jump start because once we get to those last two weeks, we'll be meeting multiple times a week, voting additional articles, and they'll be trying to wrap them all up. Um, those of you that whose articles we voted tonight, I'll give you another day or two to get them in. Thank you. Um, anything else? Nancy? Um, I just have a question. If we're unable to attend next Wednesday, is there a way other than the minutes to understand the conversation that goes on? Um, the best alternative is to talk to one of us. Just talk. Okay. 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 <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day.